to vaccinate or not to, that is the question on many people's minds. And to mask up or not to, that's another question. Even during the 1912 pandemic, there were anti-mask leagues. I'm going to ask the public for 100 days to mask. Just 100 days to mask. Not forever, 100 days. And I think we'll see a significant reduction. Today on Context, we hear from both sides of the pro and con mask and vaccine debate. And we hear from the scientists and doctors who put this often divisive issue to rest with medical facts. Plus on the queue, Pastor Connie Denbach and celebrant Sarah Hawkins Brown talk loss in the time of COVID and how we can cope. We're almost at the end of 2020, and the coronavirus is still raging around the world. With Canada being in the second wave of the pandemic, we're joined by Dr. Allison McGeer, who's on the front lines of research for COVID-19 to help us better understand all things COVID. Dr. Allison, it's been a long and arduous road. Where would you say we are right now? Well, I, I think the good news is that we're cl getting close to the end of the acute, really hard phase of COVID. The vaccines coming mean that by April of next year, we won't be rid of COVID, but things will be much better. So in February, your research team received a grant to study the risk factors and features of COVID-19 based on your observations. Is COVID insurmountable or do you have faith we'll be able to flatten the second wave pretty soon. What happens in the next three months is dependent on each and every one of us paying attention to social distancing and wearing our mask and not having contacts we don't need to have. After that, it depends on how willing we are to get vaccinated. Um, and mm. hopefully people will recognize the importance of vaccination to themselves and to the people around them. Um, and by April or May, we'll have enough people vaccinated that we'll really be able to start getting back to normal. COVID's not going away, but COVID around when lots of people have been vaccinated against it is very different from COVID around now when we're all susceptible. Okay, you, you, talking about vaccines, let's turn to that a little bit more. How safe and effective are the vaccines? And what are you seeing as it, and you know, we just heard recently, just yesterday, um, that we'll be seeing uh, some doses entering into Canada very shortly. Yes, so these, li these vaccines are getting licensed because we know they're safe and because we know in the short term that they're very effective. Obviously, we haven't had long to study these vaccines because we didn't even start thinking about making them until January of last year when the pandemic started. But people have been working 24-7, huge numbers of people working 24-7 to try to make sure that we have safe and effective vaccines. Um, and so nobody needs to worry that we've cut corners on safety or that we're letting loose a vaccine that might be associated with more side effects than usual. That's not happening. Of course, vaccines have adverse events. Everything has adverse events, including having a shower in the morning, right? Riding your bike, through, all those things. But but they are definitely going to be safer to get vaccinated than to leave yourself potentially exposed to COVID-19. Um, and in the first month after vaccination, so far, the vaccines we've seen are at least 65% and, and for a couple of them, 95% effective. That might not last. This might be a vaccine like flu vaccine where you have to get vaccinated every year, but at least for the first few months, it's going to be really good. And the only frustrating thing about them is that you have to get two doses for them to work. So it's a little mm. bit like tetanus vaccine or MMR, where you need those two doses, they have to be a month apart. So that's going to make it a little longer before the vaccine effect really kicks in. Okay. Now, COVID-19 has shown us how vulnerable our world is or can be when it comes to these super viruses. What are some takeaways that you're finding and, and you're hearing of other scientists and other doctors when it comes to super viruses in the future? So I think th there's three things that I'm taking home. The, the first thing is that pandemics are gonna be an ongoing thing of the future. We, we see outbreaks around the world in, in the last century, we've had HIV and influenza and now COVID-19. So, so this is a regular occurrence. Uh, and then the second piece is, if this is going to be a regular occurrence, we need to be better prepared for it. 
So mm -hmm. it's not that we hadn't done a lot of preparedness for this, but we could clearly be doing better. Um, and in Canada, our public health system really needs to be strengthened so that we can face these pandemics and come out of them in one piece. And then the third learning to me is about the fact that COVID has really sharply exposed inequities in our society. Uh, and uh, and I I'm hoping that after this vaccination campaign and when things get back to normal, we can start to talk about how those inequities have risen and what we can do about them. Because there's just no question that people who are low socioeconomic status, new immigrants, racialized, you know, all of the people who are um, usually lower in, in our society who don't have all the advantages that other people have are the people who are really paying the price for this pandemic. And that's something we need to prevent for the next pandemic, but it's also something we need to change fundamentally about society. Such a great point. Thank you again, Dr. Allison McGeer. And also thank you to you and your team for all of the hard work that you're doing in helping us stay protected here in Canada. Thank you. Thank you. Some people believe getting the COVID-19 vaccine is not necessary. One of these people is Ted Kuntz, the president of Vaccine Choice Canada, an organization that, according to their website, is, I quote, opposed to mandatory vaccination and upholds the right of individuals to exercise informed consent when considering an invasive medical procedure such as vaccination. Ted, thanks for joining us today. What are some of your concerns about uh, the COVID-19 vaccine and your organization's concerns about the vaccine? Well, first of all, thank you, Maggie, for inviting me. Yes, our organization is really geared around uh, ensuring our right to informed consent, or particularly around vaccinations in Canada. When I look at the situation with the COVID, uh, I, I think we're premature in, in thinking that we need a vaccine for this. Uh, the numbers don't indicate the, the urgency to uh, fast forward uh, at warp speed, uh, bypass normal prudent safety protocols, and basically uh, engage in human experimentation. Uh, they're including technology that has never been used before, uh, introducing uh, uh, RNA um, technology uh, as part of the vaccine that uh, has the potential to alter our genetic makeup um, it, it's been referred to as uh, basically a, a software change. And, and I think we need to be very cautious uh, about introducing something as this that has potential ramifications far beyond what we can imagine. Uh, when there isn't the urgency, the is, there isn't the need to do it at this time. Uh, for the greatest percentage of the population, uh, COVID is not a, a deadly condition. Uh, we know that only 3% of uh, those uh, that have purportedly died from COVID were under the age of 60. So to introduce a vaccine into that population when the risk is extremely low to me is unwarranted. Do you not think that the fact that we've lost millions of people worldwide is enough to warrant a vaccine, a, a worldwide vaccine? No, when you, when you actually look at the numbers, they, uh, let, let's stick with Canada because I think that's where it makes the most sense to look is we know that uh, in, in the first wave, 82% of COVID deaths occurred in extended care facilities. Uh, it occurred in seniors over the age of 80 that had 2.6 or more comorbidities. Uh, and so we're looking at a very vulnerable population that was at risk of uh, the common cold, at risk of influenza. And so the majority of the population is not at risk uh, so, uh, as I said, to subject them to a technology that is, uh, 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 has never been used before, and we don't know the ramifications, to me, is uh, uh, unwarranted. I would suggest it's even uh, irresponsible, immoral, uh, and I think we need to put a halt to uh, fast-forwarding something that doesn't need to be fast-forwarded. All right. We only have seconds left, Ted, but I do want to hear your thoughts on masks because your group uh, is also anti-masks. What are your thoughts on, on uh, masks being able to at least help us in, in preventing the spread of COVID? Well, first of all, our group is not anti-mask. Our, our group is, a, a, we would take the same position with masking as we do with vaccines, that it is around informed consent. We think it's important for people to be aware of both uh, uh, you know, what the research has to say and, and the potential risks of masking. 
And so the science is really clear. There are no randomized controlled trials with verified outcomes that prove a benefit to masking. It's very clear. Uh, and we also know that the use of masking, particularly cloth masking, increases the risk of respiratory infections by a factor of three. And so when you don that mask and, and when the evidence suggests uh, that it's not going to uh, protect you from a virus and it increases your risk of respiratory infections, we think people need to know that uh, as part of their decision making around masking. Ted, president of the Vaccine Choice Canada organization, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for letting me have my words. There is a lot of information coming at us from different angles. And there's a lot of conflicting information about the vaccine, masks, and what to believe. Well, here to break down fact from fiction is Sajid Fazel, health researcher from the University of Calgary. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me on. So, Sajid, we just heard from a group that doesn't believe masks are effective in protecting us against COVID-19. In fact, they report that they have documentation that says that there is no scientific evidence to support the popular idea that people wearing masks will reduce infection rates and save lives. Should we be wearing masks, Sajid? Absolutely, yes. And it's not a popular idea, rather it is based on scientific evidence. Uh, so if you look at the research so far, and it, a lot of research has shown that masks do uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19. And more so how it is, uh, Maggie, it's that if you're wearing a mask, the, it actually traps the droplets from your nose and in your mouth when you talk, when you're shouting, um, when you're coughing, it stops those droplets uh, from being suspended in the air because those fibers in the mask are what traps the uh, droplets. Now, of course, it depends on what type of mask you're wearing. We advise people to wear a three-layer cotton mask, um, which is best at preventing those droplets from being in the air. And we know that those droplets, uh, uh, the, COVID the SARS CoV-2 virus is in those droplets. So yes, it does help prevent the virus and it's an effective method. Okay. One of the other things that we're seeing in social media and other platforms is that COVID is just as deadly or not as deadly as the common flu, that the common flu is more deadlier than COVID. Is that true? Not quite. So we have to take into consideration the population we're discussing about. So for those who have chronic diseases and comorbidities, yes, COVID-19 uh, is very lethal for them. And at the end of the day, COVID-19 spreads faster than the flu, uh, and COVID-19 has a higher mortality rate. So if you look at the flu, the mortality rate uh, is very small. It's almost uh, around 0.1%. But when you look at the COVID-19, it's up to 3 to 4% in certain groups of people. It's much higher. It spreads faster. It kills more. The only thing is that it can go undetected because some symptoms may not show up up to 7 to 14 days after you've been infected. All right. Another question for you. You're just booming through all of this misinformation. We so appreciate it. Okay. PCR uh, testing has been questioned as well. Um, and some say that uh, the case of the death numbers that we're seeing have been inflated due to faulty testing. Um, can you clarify that? Is that true? Are we seeing inflated uh, reports of death uh, as we see the, the death count um, go up every single night on our evening news? No, it's not. Inf no, that's not true. It's not inflated. Um, let me mention the PCR test is one of the most accurate tests we have out there. Even these new antibody rapid tests aren't as accurate as the PCR test. That's the gold standard. Um, and so the deaths due to the right due to COVID, especially after they, they test and they, they find out that somebody has COVID or had COVID, uh, they are not inflated. It's what the actual uh, scenario is. And this is something that we have to realize. We are in a severe situation, Maggie. It's worse now than it was in May during the first wave, although some of the policies and restrictions uh, don't reflect that. And I think that's causing a false sense of security in the community. Okay. Statistics Canada reported over half of the COVID-19 related deaths are those of uh, people over the age of 85. Is it necessary then for anyone younger to get the vaccine? Absolutely. 
uh, because yes, the number of deaths are mostly to those uh, who are the older population, but that doesn't mean if you're young, you do not, uh, you won't be infected or you won't have severe disease and death. There is a good num number of uh, people who are younger uh, who have contracted COVID-19, have ended up in ICUs, and there are those who ended up in the graves too. So this is something to keep in mind. And I mean, I'm using that type of language, but I think uh, we have to realize that the severity of the situation we are in right now, we used to have up to uh, 1,500 cases per day. And now we are almost, as a Canada nationwide, almost 5,000 cases um, a day. And this is something we have to take into consideration and be serious about. Okay. Sajid, what can you say just at the end of this when it comes to a lot of misinformation out there? What do people need, need to do to make sure that they're getting valuable, accurate information? Look at what the public health agencies say. Look at what the public health authorities recommend. All right. Thank you so much again. Sajid Fazel, health researcher for the University of Calgary. Thank you again for your time. Thank you very much. Coming up on The queue, Pastor Connie Denbach and celebrant Sarah Hawkins Brown talk grief in the time of COVID. With millions of people around the world dying from the coronavirus, all of us have lost someone or something. How are we as a society dealing with death and dying? Are we losing our empathy with COVID overexposure? With Prime Minister Trudeau's recent announcement of 249,000 doses of the vaccine arriving in Canada before the end of this year, some are concerned about whether or not to take it. Apprehension has spread in some circles due to the quick nature of the delivery of the vaccine. Bioethicist Dr. Kerry Bowman is here to unpack what needs to be done as public trust has continued to wane since the pandemic began earlier this year. Dr. Bowman, there are rumors about this COVID vaccine becoming mandatory in certain sectors. What's the likelihood of this? You know, as, as an official government policy, whether it be federal or, or provincial, it, it's extremely unlikely that that would occur. Um, but what could occur, and we're already really seeing, is, you know, airlines saying you need this. Um, you know, certainly if you wanted to visit someone within hospitals, long-term care, they may absolutely insist on that. But more than that, you know, it could, the day could come, and I, I think we're not really talking about until late winter, early spring, where to go to a sports game, you may, in fact, perhaps have to have it. A restaurant, a bar, a, a, you know, an outing of some kind. So although the government is very unlikely to take a fixed position on this, what we could find as things roll along is that our lives, if we don't have it, become more and more uh, circumscribed, more and more limited. Well, just last night I saw uh, a news piece where there's an app being uh, formulated that would, you know, you'd log in and say that you'd received your vaccine and then that would determine if you could go into uh, certain, you know, public spaces like a ball game or so forth. So uh, could that mean more legal actions in the future? It could because those things could be challenged. <clears throat> What I don't think will happen, though, is the workplace, meaning, you know, people say you, you cannot come back to work and we won't employ you unless you have it. Now, there's exceptions to that, like hospitals and long term care. They may be able to say that, but it's very unlikely a workplace could say that. Um, but look, we may have legal challenges on this on both sides, because some yeah. people could also say, I actually don't want to go back and work in an office until my coworkers are vaccinated. Mm. Um, and, and so there could be challenges there, but it's very unlikely from an employment, and I'm not a lawyer, but I'm, I'm repeating what I've heard from lawyers, that you know any, any group could say you are not allowed to work here without the vaccine outside of healthcare. But as I said, you know, market forces will take over and, and w uh, many of us may, may find that, that, that in fact, it's very, what we can do is very limited if we don't have the vaccine. Right. Let's talk about trust. When looking at the issue of trust between public and the government and the notion of transparency, how have you seen that play out when it comes to transparency between both groups? Yeah, it hasn't been perfect. And, you know, the Canadian response has not been perfect. But I'm going to say what it, so many people say, compared to the United States, it's, it's quite an improvement. And that's true. 
But, you know, trust doesn't help in the early days, you know, repeatedly. I'm talking March here, February, March, mm -hmm. low risk. We've got cases in Canada. No, it's low risk. It's low risk. Uh, no need to wear a mask. Those kinds of things tend to erode trust because people remember those things and they remember those things coming from people in authority. So that that is is is, you know, quite a concern. What will influence trust now is trust in the vaccine. And those questions go way beyond Canada. And, you know, one of yeah. the things that will happen, you know, because the vaccine is now being distributed, is that as more and more of it is distributed, people will look. And in fact, if there's not significant reactions that are negative, um, you know, I, I, I think trust will increase. And there are many Canadians that are undecided or hesitant. Most Canadians say they will get a vaccine. But in fairness, we don't actually have all the information yet on the vaccines because we're waiting for it. Yeah, there there was also an anti-mask league in 1918, in the 1918 pandemic. So we've been here before where there are some who are even hesitant still about wearing masks. So are are people's concerns about masks justified? Well, you know, when I look at masks and, and when I when I talk and I've spoken to people that are against wearing masks, you know, it's an infringement upon my freedom. It does come down to ethics because, you know, if a person is, I don't know, 25 and healthy, it doesn't mean they're not going to get sick, by the way. And some of them can get very sick. But, you know, what they may be saying is I'm free and I'm willing to take my chances. But, you know, ethics has been a huge element in this pandemic, because really, as we know, it's really not about you when it comes to masks. Mm -hmm. It's about protecting vulnerable people within society and hopefully creating an environment where we can move forward more quickly as a society. Because we've got vulnerable people medically, but we've got vulnerable people psychologically living in you know, depressive states. Uh, there's people in abusive relationships. You know, so, so wearing a mask, it, it, it's really, I'm going to say, an act of altruism in a lot of ways. But look, altruism is a language that some people, it resonates very, very deeply on a personal or religious level. And some people, it does not. It's not a convincing argument at all. That's the challenge. Yeah, so many challenges during this season. Thank you again, bioethicist Dr. Carrie Bowman. Thank you again for your time today. Thank you. All right, so we've heard the facts from the scientists. We've heard both sides of the pro and anti-mask and vaccine debate. But the fact remains that death and dying is all around us. As news organizations report daily death tolls, we're faced, each of us, with a difficult conversation to have with loved ones about the end of life. Here to talk about this delicate and deeply personal issue are two people who deal with this in their life's work, celebrant Sarah Hawkins Brown and Pastor Connie Denbach. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you so much for having us. Great to be here. So Sarah, you help families walk through grief every day and yet you say we become a grief phobic society. What do you mean by that? Yeah, I think that overall we are, um, we have a hard time in our Western society dealing with things that are uh, difficult in any way, emotionally, sadness, anger, fear, the unknown. And because we don't really talk about death a whole lot, it's just not a, com it's not the dinner conversation that comes up. It's something that when we are faced with, which we, of course we all have to, that is our reality, we have to face dealing with the death of a loved one, um, both when we are dealing with the death and it's all of our sadness and grief and things like that that we don't want to feel, um, as well as if somebody we know who has lost a loved one, we don't know what to say. We don't know how to approach that person. And so sometimes we, in fear, I think, just opt for the option of not talking about it all. You know, we get your three days bereavement, um, you go back to work, and you're just supposed to pick up life as though this massive um, you know, event has just happened. This person that was a huge part of your life is not physically here anymore. And we're just sort of expected to pick up and go on. Yeah, to pretend we're happy and, and to move on. Co Connie, right. as a collective, do you feel we've grown numb to the increasing number of people that we're losing each day as we watch the toll go up every single night? Well, one of the interesting things, I looked up my statistics before, before, before now and I've done half the number of funerals this year that I had at this time last year. And I don't think it's because there are fewer deaths in the community. But what we're seeing more frequently are families that are opting 
not only not to be buried from a funeral home with a minister officiating, but families that are essentially opting to send grandma to the crematorium and go back to work the next day. And there has not been a historical precedent for that non-observance of farewells and death rites since, since the, the days when there were huge losses, say in the play, mm. there is a sense that it, we're hearing so much, we're seeing so much, we don't want to think about it. And so families aren't getting together, they're not grieving, and it's doing desperate things to them. I mean, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And when people try to skip mourning, it comes back at them in a thousand ways. It comes back. We're seeing incidences of clinical depression, anxiety, alcohol use, cannabis use, even psychosis that I have never seen, particularly in young people before. And I think there is a collective, a collective grief, a collective mourning, not only for death, but for all of the things that we've we've lost. And we yeah. need a way to, we need a way to put it into a spiritual context. So Sarah, how do we face that? How do we face loss throughout this year, as Connie said, and also death? How do we face that honestly and in a healthy way? Uh, the best way to get through grief is to grieve. So we really do truly just, we can't go around it. We can't go um, hop over it. We must move through it. And um, one of the ways that we do that is through uh, a personalized, you know, meaningful storytelling service that really reflects that, per that, that loved one yeah. um, well. And so, yeah, but like I said, direct cremation, where, which is what we call those who just send them to the crematorium and have nothing, that was on the rise well before the pandemic anyways, mm. uh, because people just don't know that they have other, other options. There's um, wonderful ministers like Connie, there's celebrants like myself. There are lots of ways to, whether you call it a, mean, a, a funeral, a memorial, a right. celebration of life, I don't really care what you call it, but that's such a critical first step, I believe, in people's grief journeys. In the grieving. Okay, mm -hmm. Connie, we just have seconds left. And I just wanna hear from you, how do you resolve your faith? As, as you talked about, we've lost so much this year, expectations, loss of jobs, plans, all of those things, as well as loved ones. How do we find and ground ourselves in our faith during this time? We only have seconds left. We have to go back to the manger, to the kid whose family, whose extended family were far away, couldn't make it for the birth, who didn't have the presence, who all he had was, was mom and dad and uh, crappy surroundings. And we need to understand that we can find God in all circumstances, not just when things are looking fantastic. Mm. So good. Sarah Hawkins Brown and Pastor Connie Denbach, thank you so much for your time today. We'll be right back. Thank you all for watching. We couldn't do this program without our amazing team behind the scenes or you, our donors, who help ensure that we cover Christian analysis on news and current events. For more information, you can go to our website, context.show. For all of us here, thanks for watching.